Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, this is the first time I'm holding this talk, so um, I'm looking to all of you to provide some feedback on whether this resonates with you. Uh, I've already sort of described like the tagline to the other speakers in the speaker room, and they started nodding just as you know in the second sentence. So I'm a little bit encouraged, and that's good. Um, so what do I want to talk about? What does polyglot even mean? I have two things that I want to try to convince you of today. Right. Most software, most software systems that you deploy to production already have multiple programming languages as their base. You're already deploying polyglot software. And a build tool that supports polyglot development helps your company to be more successful. What? All right, let's start from the beginning. Um, there is actually <coughs> the next slide. Here we go. Uh, there is a book. There is a scientific evidence that a certain set of uh, capabilities are important for software development and to bring software successfully into the market and to help your company be successful or your organization be successful. And I want to focus on four of these capabilities. So not all 24, but just some of them. The first one is, you should implement continuous integration. I, it's pretty clear, right? I mean, we all do that, I hope. Um, but there is actually scientific evidence that this makes you more successful. If you don't do this, you'll be less successful. The next one is test automation. Again, hopefully you all do that already, but you really need to push this forward, not because you love tests, but because you are more successful if you use tests and automated testing. Then um, you also want to be nimble, you want to be agile. And part of that is to foster and enable team experimentation. You want to keep the door open for new technologies or new approaches that you haven't thought of before. And your organization needs to make sure that your teams have the space and the time to do that. And finally, you also want to support and facilitate collaboration between your teams. So if your organization consists of multiple teams, you want to make sure that they have the opportunity of working together to achieve more than the sum of the parts. All right, so let's look at an example of what this would actually look like. Um, we have a very simple application. We have a database. We have a web server. And you know, someone looks at the website on a desktop machine. Oh, and we also have an Android app because mobile is in. And of course, not just Android, but also an iOS app. So does it look familiar to you? Do you have something like this in your data centers, in your cloud projects? Please, can you raise your hand? I see some hands. I want to see most of them. Come on. OK. So another question for you. How many languages, how many different programming languages do you use regularly? And with programming languages, I mean everything from JavaScript to SQL. Um, Java, Python, Go. So all of those who work with one programming language, please raise your hand now. OK, how about two programming languages? Some three. How about that? Oh, all right, four. Five? More than five? All right. I, I think there was a peak at three. So, so basically all of you already have that problem today. So now when we talk about these systems, right, it's not a single programming language. I mean, there are frameworks, and we heard of, about some of them today. Um, that allow you to deploy the same code to multiple platforms and you know multiple 
ways of, of delivering the software to your customers. Uh, but the normal case is that you have multiple programming languages. And if you, even if you don't have that today, chances are you don't want to stay at the same point where you are today. Chances are you want to increase your range. You want to maybe you want to acquire another company. But what are the chances that they use exactly the same source, you know, the same programming language? Yeah. So now I'm, I'm trying to, to, to get to the second part of it. Um, now when you want to implement test automation, this, this, is, a, this is already overwhelming. How many of you actually have integration tests that run across more than one device? Integration tests that were part of the test runs on two different devices, at least two. Wow, that's not a lot of people. But most of you have software that runs on multiple devices in production. So why aren't you testing that? And so what I think is that your build system can do quite a bit of the heavy lifting for you. If you have a good build system, it makes it easy for you to do these things. If you have a bad build system, it makes it much harder for you to do these things. And so the build system I want to talk about today is Bazel. I've been working on Bazel for over 10 years. I could, you know, you could say that I'm a Bazel expert. Um, but it's not specific to Bazel. I want to describe how Bazel approaches these things, but you should be able to do these with any build system, really. Um, and we're seeing sort of, in, in terms of development, we're already seeing other build systems start to add similar infrastructure um, that sort of to what, I, to what Bazel has. You know, I, I think they're all copying us. Uh, <laughs> But we're seeing more infrastructure to support these use cases and make it easier for you to do these things. All right, so for Bazel, I want to talk about three. Huh. All right, what is Bazel actually? <laughs> um, so I hope most of you are already using a build tool. Uh, if any of these sound familiar to you, make, maven, Gradle, make, cmake, and Break, Grunt, Gulp, Ninja, Pants, Buck, Basil, Scans, and then they are already using a build system. Basil is similar to these in what it does, although of course it does things slightly differently. So I want to talk about three things in Basil specifically. How, first of all, in, as part of Basil development, we found a model that is very much language independent, as far as we can tell. Maybe it doesn't work for all languages, but it works for all the languages that we have seen so far. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about how to interoperate between multiple languages in Bazel, and then finally, how that extends to the use case of integration testing that, that we have. All right, let's start with any language. I, Pull this Haskell example from the documentation of the Haskell libraries. Um, what's going on here? This is this is a Bazel build file, or sort of like a Bazel build file. Um, and there are a couple of things here that I want to focus on. But, so the big things are the rules, and the rules have name properties. And here we have two rules that have sources that reference source files on your on your file system. And then we have dependencies. So the thing up at the top is a library, and it's referenced from the binary rule, from the other rule. And there is also a dependency between the base rule there, uh, indicated by the string base. Not surprisingly. And this is an import rule. And an import rule to Bazel means this comes from somewhere else. Uh, in this case, it's something that's part of the uh, Haskell standard library. Uh, but if you were developing C or C++, it might be an object file. If you're developing Java, it might be a jar file. So it's something that was produced before and th that you just reuse for what it's worth. All right, and so 
this rule down here is a binary rule which indicates to Bazel that you can run it on your computer. So you type in Bazel run this rule and it runs it. So these are two or three of the typical types of things that you want to do with your, with your source code. You want to organize your source code into libraries, into reusable parts uh, that either multiple teams can use or that multiple people can use and can be used in different places. And then if you do, you know, backend or um, desktop development, you, then you want to be able to build binaries that you can run on these machines. Now this doesn't cover all the things that you might want to do. Maybe you have an, a mobile app that might be a, you know, a, an Android app or it might be an iOS app rule uh, or you might want to build a Docker image or a zip file. Um, but sort of these concepts are reusable. They're very common across multiple languages. <coughs> All right. So in terms of languages that Bazel covers, uh, this is a selection. It's a pretty broad selection, I think. We have C++, C++, C++ Java, Python, Haskell, Scala, JS on Node. I'm, I'm, I'm specifically mentioning Node here because Node also runs on the back end. So you would also have something like a binary. Uh, if you have front-end JavaScript, you would be, you might call it a binary, but it's really more like, you know, a package that you, you put together and then send to the browser or have the browser request from you. Uh, Swift, Go, Ruby, Rust, Kotlin, TypeScript, D, Perl, of all things, uh, Objective-C, and it's extensible. You can, there can be language experts for, for other languages that say, okay, uh, I want to provide rules for you know, developers of this language for Bazel uh, that are reusable and that everyone can use to do development in these languages. All right, so how does interoperability work? Now that's a big topic and I'm only going to give one fairly small example uh, for time reasons. Um, so I'm going to focus on Java, Scala and Groovy. Um, I'm taking these because they all deploy to the Java VM uh, and also I'm doing a lot of Java development so I'm more familiar with them. Uh, but you might also take C, C++, Go and Rust and build them into a single binary if you wanted to. Which is not to say that Bazel supports all that today, but it's something that a good polyglot build system should support and that Bazel is aiming to support at some point. So, um, I basically use the same example. Uh, I'm importing a jar file from Java. Uh, I use a Scala library that I wrote. Uh, I use a Groovy, Groovy to, to provide the binary to sort of pull things together. And this is a binary rule, so I can run this. So let me run this. Yeah, that didn't work. Okay, what I want to emphasize here is these aren't built into the build tool are external rules that other people have written, people that don't even know about each other, right? The people who wrote the Groovy rules had no contact with the people who wrote the Scala rules. But the one thing that I need to do here is I need to tell Basil, that I want to use these rules. So I need to import them in, in my build file. Now this is not, there is a little bit more, thing, you know, a little bit more that I have to do to get these rules, um, but it's not much. I basically, I copy paste a small snippet of text into another text file so that it's sort of globally registered for, for Bazel inside the project. And then I run it and it prints Hello World. Now, yeah, Hello World, yeah. What's, what's important for me here is it, it literally didn't take me 10 minutes to write this from scratch. I didn't install a compiler, I didn't install a library, I just, I mean I had to install Bazel of course because you know, that's sort of the thing that underlies it, but I didn't have to figure out how to run the Scala compiler or the Groovy compiler because that's part of the rules that someone else has written, it's knowledge that someone else has put together for me to reuse. And so I just tell Basil, please, I want to use the Scala rules, I want to use the Groovy rules, and then it automatically pulls everything together and makes it work. Now, 
Maybe you're concerned about security and you don't want it to automatically download files from random places on the internet. And Bazel has you covered there too. No worries. But the fast pass is that it can do these things for you and can automatically download them and just makes it work. All right, so remote execution. Let's go back to our example uh, where we have a database and a server and we have different apps. Now, what your build tool needs to do in order to support this, um, it needs to do three things. It needs to have devices available to support your use cases, right? Without devices, the best build system can't help you. So there need to be devices, but you already need those devices anyway to do the development in the first place. And ideally, the build tool can just reuse your existing devices, or you can have a, I mean, in your company or organization, you might have a pool of devices that are dedicated to the build system to allow you to, to you know, cover all the use cases that you have. Now the build system also needs to be able to identify devices and sort of platforms. We, we call these platforms in Bazel, and so a platform corresponds to a, a type of device and an operating system, and maybe you know things that are already installed on that device or an operating system version. Um, how how specific you want the platform to, to be depends on your use case. And it's fully extensible, so you can define your own platforms depending on what your needs are. And so the build system needs to be able to needs to understand and model platforms, whatever it's you know whatever it calls them. Basically, calls them platforms. We don't have to call them platforms, but we do. Um, and then needs to combine that knowledge with the knowledge about languages. So in this case, we want to compile Objective C. And so the build system needs to know when you want to compile Objective-C, it has to do that on a Mac, because the Objective-C compiler is shipped with Mac OS. And then the final part is that the build system needs to be actually able to execute those actions on those machines, and also provide the necessary inputs, right? In order to compile Objective-C, I need the source files on the device, otherwise I can't compile it. And Bazel has this knowledge, and then it can run on a Mac or on a Linux machine, or it can even do integration testing across multiple devices. In this example, um, I'm running a server on a Windows machine, and I'm running an app on an Android device that have, you know, tethered to the Windows machine, and I have an integration test that covers both these devices. Um, and more generally, in principle, you know, these things are necessary for the build system to allow you to, to write integration tests that can touch on more than two devices, three or four or ten, uh, depending on what, what your needs are. Which isn't to say that Bazel supports all of these things today, um, but it has all the knowledge and infrastructure to do that. So now, test automation is, I find it less less scary as a concept because we have this knowledge, this knowledge base that is provided by multiple people and these, we have these abstractions in the build system. We can now imagine what an integration test would look like. So let's take a step back. I've, I've talked about Bazel, I've talked about three Bazel features, how Bazel handles multiple languages, uh, how language interrupt works at least with one example and how it, it manages to do remote execution. Let's pop up another level and look at the capabilities that I, I presented in, in the first place. So if you, if you consider continuous integration, if you have a build system that supports all the languages in, you know, in your environment, in your, in your project, um, then you can potentially ch say, please just build me my entire project. And it builds the Linux server and the Android app and the iOS app in a single invocation. So anyone can do that. You don't need to have three machines and two devices on your desk. One machine is enough for you to do your work. And then you can send out that work to other devices to do parts of the work and to pull everything together. And of course, that also facilitates test automation. 
because now the build system can model multiple devices talking to each other and create a virtual network and have, you know, start pieces of the test on different devices for them to talk with each other and get an end-to-end -end integration test. And of course, making, by lowering the barrier to entry, you also make it easier for teams to experiment, right? Maybe there is a team in your organization and they really would like to try out Haskell because they think that the, the formalisms that are provided by Haskell and the sort of the mathematical foundations are really good for that one use case where you reach, need to be really sure that the code is correct. And so if you use Haskell, you have sort of a higher assurance because you can do, I don't know, mathematical proofs or something. I'm not saying that I'm doing that personally. Um, but maybe there are projects in your organization that would benefit from other languages or other systems. And by making it easy for, for teams to try out these things, and not just that, but also making it easy to transfer that to other users. Right? If I install the scatter rules into, into my workspace, um, and then I commit that, and you check it out, then Bazel will download the Scala compiler for you, or you know, have a fixed location where I have put it. Um, and so the, the build just works for you. You don't have to manually install you know, additional stuff on every developer machine. And then, of course, by making it easy to jump into someone else's code base. Right? For the Haskell rules, I don't know any Haskell. I, <laughs> right? I've, I've never written any Haskell. But I can look at the rules and at least understand the structure of the build. And that already makes it much easier than if I have to go and learn you know, Make or Cabal or some other build system to even understand what's going on. So I'm, I'm hoping that we're coming to the end. I'm hoping that um, you, you have provided input on, on the first question. It, it seems like most of you have to work with multiple languages. Uh, and I think we can generalize that, that that most software is actually built, you know, most software systems uh, is actually built from multiple languages. Uh, and I hope that based on, on the scientific evidence um, that, that is, is described in the book, um, I can convince you that a polyglot build tool can contribute to the success of your company, or a bad build system can, can be a significant cost in terms of your development um, and, and make you not perform as well. So I hope you will all go home and start using Polyglot build tools uh, or Bazel, one of them. Um, and thank you very much for your 